Chair Miller, and soon uh, Commissioner May will join us as well, also joined by uh, Commissioner Shapiro and Commissioner Turnbull. We're also joined by the Office of Zoning staff, Ms. Sharon Schellen, also the, uh, Mr. Paul Young, who's handling all of our virtual operations. Tonight's uh, hearing is Zoning Commission case number 09-03F. This is Skyland Holdings, LLC, PUD modification of significance at square 5663, lot 22. And again, today's date is July 23rd, 2020. Copies of today's virtual public hearing notice are available on the Office of Zoning's website. Please be advised that this proceeding is being recorded by a court reporter is also webcast live, which includes WebEx, and YouTube Live. The video will be available on the officers on his website after the hearing or somewhere around about that time, somewhere there so after. Accordingly, all those listening on WebEx or by phone will be muted during the hearing until the appropriate time. Please state your name and home address before providing oral testimony on your presentation. When you are finished speaking, please mute your audio so that your microphone is no longer picking up sound or background noise. Again, mute and unmute is how these things really go well. If you experience difficulty accessing WebEx or with your telephone call in, then please call our OZ hotline number at 202-727-5471. And I'll repeat that at the end of my statement to sign up or receive WebEx login or call in instructions. All persons planning to testify either in favor, opposition, or undeclared in virtual hearings, we encourage you to sign up in advance. At the time of sign up, all participants complete the oath or affirmation required by Subtitle Z, Section 408.7. If you wish to file written testimony or additional supporting documents during the hearing, then please be prepared to describe and discuss it at the time of your testimony, as we have not had time to review your documents. This hearing will be conducted in accordance with provisions of 11Z DCMR Chapter 4 as follows. Preliminary matters, applicant's case, the applicant has up to 60 minutes. Report of the Office of Planning and Department of Transportation. Report of other government agencies. Report of the ANC. And then we'll have testimony, testimony of organizations. Uh, organizations will have five minutes. Testimony of individuals will have three minutes, respectively. And we will hear them in the order of support opposition and undeclared and then after all of that we will have rebuttal and closing by the app while the commission reserves the right to change the time limits for presentations if necessary it intends to adhere to the time limits as strictly as possible and notes that no time shall be seen again the oz hotline number for any technical issues please call 202-727-5471 again 202-727 5471 for an outstanding issues during this hearing. At this time, the commission will consider any preliminary matters. Does the staff have any preliminary matters? Yes, sir. Um, the first thing is that Exhibit 18, the applicant is requesting a waiver from the requirement to file a notarized attestation for the affidavit of posting and maintenance. As many of the applicants have um, had the same problem with. Um, they're asking to file an affirmation due to COVID-19, the issue of getting out and getting to a notary. So that's the first preliminary matter to see if the commission will waive that. Okay, let me just look by show of hands. Any objections? Okay, I don't see any objections. Okay, we'll do that. Michelle, next. Um, the next, there are three proffered expert witnesses, um, Cheryl O'Neill, uh, previously accepted in architecture, uh, Dwight Fincher, he was previously accepted, I had to look him up, he is being uh, proffered in architecture also, and of course, Erwin Andres, previously accepted in transportation. Okay, everyone has been accepted. Uh, any, any objections to continue that status? Not seeing it. And as I've already noted, I'll just say this for the record, uh, Vice Chair Miller and Commissioner May, I said they would be joining shortly, but they are here. For the record. Anything else, Michelle? That is all that staff has. Um, if Mr. Young wants to start bringing on the applicant, if the commission is ready.
Okay, Mr. Uh, Tummins, I think we have all, well, I don't know if all your team is up. I see uh, Mr. Neal and others, but anyway, we'll turn it over to you and let you begin. Wonderful. Um, so I think we will first go uh, to uh, Mr. Young and have him pull up our PowerPoint presentation. And you needed 45 minutes, is that correct? So you can. Yes, we're hopeful that we can, you know, be a little under that, but I think putting 45 on the clock works for us. Okay. Okay, great. Excellent, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, members of the commission. I am Paul Thomas of Golston and Stores. Megan Hodel Cox of Golston and Stores is also here uh, with me in support of this modification of significant application. We'll have five witnesses this afternoon who will be presenting their testimony. Gary Rapport and Brad Fennell on behalf of the applicant. Cheryl O'Neill, who's the architect for the town center as a whole and also blocks three and four. And Dwight Fincher, architect for block one. Uh, as noted, Erwin Andrus is our traffic uh, and transportation expert in this case, and he will also be presenting his testimony. Our pre-hearing submission materials detail the significant work that the applicant team has done with response in response to the set-down comments that we received from OP and the Zoning Commission. In addition, we filed in the record yesterday a statement which addresses comments or issues that were raised in the OP and DDOT reports, which were filed in the record last week. Our comprehensive testimony this afternoon will address all of these issues. We are pleased to note that this application has the support of the Office of Planning, the Department of Transportation, and ANC 7B. With that, uh, I know we have a lot to cover in our presentation, and I will now have Gary Rappaport present his testimony. All right. <clears throat> can, you, um, can you all hear me, please? Uh, yes, we yep, can. Go ahead, Gary. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to start by giving a brief project history. In 2001, our team of Marshall Heights CDC, Washington East Foundation, both community nonprofits, Harrison Malone, and Rappaport was formed. In May 2002, we were selected to develop Skyland. When the development was expanded to include a residential component, W.C. Smith shortly thereafter joined the Skyland development team. I'm proud to say the Skyland development team is the same development team for almost 20 years, working with the district, many community groups, and homeowners. Skyland was initially approved by the Zoning Commission in 2010 for a mixed-use town center anchored by Walmart with significant additional retail and approximately 500 residential units. Walmart withdrew from the project in 2016, and we have been actively pursuing a new anchor for the Skyland Town Center for several years. Rappaport oversees over 1,750 tenant leases and is the largest retail leasing company in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area with relationships with many retail tenants. We're very excited to have signed a lease with Lidl, one of the largest and most credit-worthy grocery stores in the world. Lidl is very well respected with a commitment to quality products at a low price, which is an ideal match for the Skyland community that needs quality grocery stores. At the International Council of Shopping Centers annual conference in May 2019, Mayor Bowser and I were on stage together where the mayor announced that Lidl was joining Skyland as a new anchor tenant. And I thanked her and others in her administration and in prior administrations for, the dedicated, for their dedicated commitment that they have made to the development of the Skyland Town Center over so many years. With regard to the medical office building use, we have hired Cushman and Wakefield to market that space to providers such as George Washington University Health System, Unity, MedStar, Trinity School of Nursing, Kaiser Permanente, and John Hopkins University Health System. 
The medical office building will provide much needed medical services to the community around Skyland at a centralized, easy accessible location. It is also positioned to serve physicians practicing at nearby United Medical Center. With the addition of Lidl as an anchor, the project will also include a Starbucks with a drive through a small inline retail building, a medical office building, and future additional residential units. As the architectural team will discuss in more detail, this application is for a modification to the entire Skyland property except block two. The project is revised to be a total of four blocks. We believe the town center as modified will allow the project to move forward with an exciting mix of uses needed in the community. With that, I'll turn it over to Cheryl to walk through blocks three and four of the project. Um, so I, I just got to test. Uh, Mr. Young, could you let, or uh, Ms. Shellen, could you let uh, Cheryl O'Neill back in? Cheryl, I, I see you up there. I think you just need to unmute yourself. Here. Uh, Mr. Young, do you know it's is she back in? She's in, uh, Mr. Thomas, but she I think it looks it's showing on my screen that she's still muted. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we then go to until we can do that? What we can do is uh we can go to Mr. Fincher's uh presentation. She's, uh, she's Fincher. unmuted. Well, she was unmuted, Mr. T Thomas, not the right. but she's muted again. Cheryl, can you hear us? She's back muted. She's unmuted now. Hold it right there. Right. I'm good. Can you hear me? Yay. All right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> One of the vagaries of virtual connections. Yeah. So good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to present the updated and we think very exciting uh, transformation of the Skyland uh, development site. As many of you are familiar, this is the this is an exhibit that documents the kind of surrounding conditions. Skyland is up at the edge of the district. Um, this is a developing um, center that's beginning its transformation from a service parking lot with a, a scattering of retail developments into a vibrant town center. It is surrounded on the outskirts with a, a variety of different kinds of developments, several multifamily apartment buildings, as well as the Safeway parking lot across the street, across Alabama Avenue. Can I have the next, please? And the next slide, please. Yeah, and as you know, um, block two, which is the first phase of this de development, which is, we think, one of the most significant, is beginning the transformation of the development into a mixed-use town center. You see on the right-hand side some of the um, construction photographs of the existing development, which is, this is a this is a mixed use building of just over 200 um, residential units with ground floor retail on all of its sides. What you're looking at on the right hand side there is the development of the main street town center drive of the development with its ground floor retail continuously along the street and then three stories of residential above in keeping with the kind of characteristic of the surrounding development um, in a very kind of traditional style that we think will create a really wonderfully animated and pedestrian friendly um, town center drive. Can I have the next please? And this is shows you the overall master plan of the development. Block two, which we were just looking at is not part of this application. We are proposing um, adjustments to the master plan in keeping with the town center concept for three of the other blocks. Block three on the upper right hand side of that development proposes a, a number of new re retail uses for the development, complementing the ground floor retail in block two. Block four, just to the left of it, 
uh, is a stage one PUD only, and I will talk about that at the end of my uh, at the end of my talk. And then lastly, block one uh, fronting directly onto Naylor Ho Road um, is a uh, mixed use development with a new medical office building and associated parking that Dwight Frenchrow um, will talk about at the end of um, at the end of my talk. Can I have the next, please? So I think all of these various uses really complement and really support the idea of this is a mixed use town center development. Most significantly and everything that has been accomplished to date on the development is the subdivision of, the, of this previously surface parking lot, you know, separated retail uses into a real town center by the creation of town center drive. Obviously block two that you just saw previously is really an important part of the transformation of the site and the, and the beginning of the development of town center drive as an animated public realm um, with a variety of uses. The new uses on block three, the new retail uses will complement those activities on the ground floor. Block four, a stage one application will provide mixed use uh, on the ground floor as well as sub substantial new residential uses. And then block three in, with its medical office building uses will also be providing another complement to the other uses within the town center. All of those much needed within this area of the district. Next slide, please. And these, these drawings are a little bit abstract, but we just did want to emphasize the kind of transformation of this site that has happened over the course of the development of it through the through the pod as well as through um, the implementation of block two. On the left hand slide within the dotted line, you see the layout of the area where it was previously prior to the approval of the pod, a bunch of freestanding um, retail buildings separated from the streets surrounded by parking. And on the right hand side, you see a kind of in a figure ground, kind of a technical term we call just the footprint of the building, but just showing that new uses now abut um, Naylor Road and Good, Good Hope Road along the, the con continuous street frontage, as well as the development of Town Center Drive as a mixed use pedestrian animated street that we think will really anchor the development and will establish a new place, uh, a new town center for this area of the district. Can I have the next, please? So to talk more specifically about the two blocks that I will talk about, block three and block four, block through block three is part of the consolidated PUD. And can I have the next slide, please? Block three, as you know, is comprised entirely of new retail uses. It proposes a new approximately 30,000 square foot Lidl grocery store anchored on the corner and fronting onto Town Center Drive. In addition to that, there will be a new 10,000 square foot retail building fronting onto Town Center Drive, supplying new neighborhood scaled retail uses, as well as the new Starbucks, yes, with a drive through on the corner, anchoring the entry and uh, the entrance into the development. These uses are all one story. They will, yes, they will be parked with um, surface parking lots. But again, we think we've adequately screened those and provided um, for adequate measures to really preserve the idea of this as a town center community. Next, please. This just shows you a little bit of the, of the loading of, of the new retail uses. And we've been very careful to screen these from visibility from public right-of-ways as well as from adjacent neighborhoods. The drawing that you see on the right-hand side is the idea of the Lytle um, um, service that is all contained within a service, um, a service court that is protected from visibility from the neighbors, as well as from the surface parking lot, all enclosed within an enclosing um, exterior wall. And then the inline retail and the Starbucks will all have their own service bay um, within the surface parking lot. And again, there are no ex exterior dumpsters or any of the other kind of visible uh, means of the service into and out of these buildings. And again, all of their frontages, their major frontages are on Town Center Drive. And the next please. This is just to talk a little bit about the view and the screening of the, of the visibility of these, especially the service uses from adjacent neighborhoods. This is a view from the end of Akron Place, which is the, the last house on the end of that um, uh, short road. And just to give you a sense of the visibility from those houses into um, the surface parking lot, as well as to the service uses for the Lytle, uh, which are closest to it. And you can see 
even with the existing trees, as well as in the supplemental planting that we are providing in the parking lot, they are adequately screened from any of those, from any of those roots. Can I have the next, please? This begins to show you an elevation of the three new retail buildings in block three along Town Center Drive. On the left-hand side, you see the end of the Lidl. Uh, the Lidl grocery store, and you can see there's a lot of transparency along that facade. This is one of their kind of more urban formats of that store, which we think contributes a new kind of different architecture um, to Town Center Drive. A lot of visibility with an entrance to the building on the corner. So again, animating and helping to activate Town Center Drive. In the middle, we're proposing a approximately 10,000 square foot inline retail building, which will provide a lot of smaller scale neighborhood retail uses, front primary frontage along Town Center Drive, a lot of possible entries along that drive to animate the streetscape. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the Starbucks um, faces towards um, the inline retail building with potentially an exterior um, patio. And again, helping to animate a lot of the activity along Town Center Drive. Next one, please. This shows you some of the inspiration for the inline build, retail building, the 10,000 square foot retail building along um, Town Center Drive. Again, we were looking to, towards for inspiration for some of the more traditional architecture on, on Block 2 across the way, as well as some of the historic precedents within Anacostia. Next, please. And this is a view um, for, kind of from the end of Town Center Drive, looking towards um, Block 4, towards Lidl. You can see the inline retail building along the right hand side, maintaining the char character of the street with its very traditional kind of character, but also the cadence and the transparency, helping to activate and animate the activity along the street. Just to the right, you see the Starbucks, and then further along, you can see the Lidl in the background. Can I have the next, please? This is looking the other way from the back end of the Lidl, looking towards the inline retail. You can also see that we have preserved all of the previously approved um, designs for the streetscape along Town Center Drive. Can I have the next, please? And this is the, the very end of the Lidl store looking towards Block 4, um, which we will talk about a little, a little bit more. But again, the character of Town Center Drive with its parallel parking, its narrow right of way, Street trees and a lot of landscaping along the street um, with the new buildings is preserved as this kind of important pedestrian activated realm. Can I have the next, please? And this is this next series looks at the end of the street, which we think was of particular importance to, uh, to the Office of Planning and to others. This is the view at the end of the street um, at Alabama Avenue and the entrance to Town Center Drive. At the end of, this, of the Starbucks building there, we've created a small plaza, which we think helps kind of terminate the street and create a public gathering space. It works well, we think, with the Block 2 facade that's across the way that creates a different kind of tower-like element that serves as a kind of gateway into the development. On the right-hand side, this kind of plaza will create a kind of gathering place and a place of, of repose um, uh, at the intersection of those two very important streets. And then the next series of views will look down Alabama Avenue, kind of showing you the characteristic of the landscape um, and the streetscape characteristic along that street. Can I have the next, please? And so this is just beyond um, the, the plaza and the, and the trellis uh, element at the corner that creates that kind of signature element. You can see there's a substantial amount of um, buffering in terms of landscaping and the trees. I should mention that the trees in these photographs are shown at about 12 plus years beyond. Uh, these are about 30 foot trees. They will be about 14 foot trees uh, at planting. So substantially less than shown here. You can also see that we've also included substantial landscaping along the parking lot side to really screen the view of the, of the cars from the Alabama Avenue street frontage. And can I have the next please? And this is a little bit further down the street, moving further down Alabama Avenue. Can I have the next, please? And this is at the corner, looking at the entrance directly into um, the primary entrance into the surface parking lot for the Lidl. You can see in the background there, the inline retail, the facades of that building were wrapped completely around the parking lot. So you will not get the view of this as a back to the building. Can I have the next, please? 
a little bit more closer view of the entrance into the parking lot. Next, please. And just to give you a sense of what it looks like, will look like with the tree, with the leaves not on the trees, this is a view of the winter, the winter view looking into the Lido parking lot where you can get a sense of uh, what the bar frame will be maintained throughout um, the winter months. And can I have the next, please? And then this next series, we'll talk about the development of block one, block four, I'm sorry, again, block four is a stage one PUD. Um, and so we are here for preliminary um, approval of the massing um, idea of uses of that building. Can I have next, please? This is the ground floor of that building. Um, this is proposed as approximately 250 unit residential building with about 7,000 square feet of retail on the ground floor. Obviously, the idea of the retail and the ground floor complements and extends the idea of Town Center Drive. Really important to this building was that we would kind of create with the inset there a kind of a plaza at the end of Town Center Drive that would terminate it. We have located the retail and the amenity uses for the building on that ground floor to really animate that as an active space that terminates Town Center Drive. And then you can see that the retail uses, um, I mean, the residential uses, you know, create a series of fingers and really wonderful courtyards, we think, looking into the ravine at the back of the site, creating a really, we think, a really wonderful kind of massing and, um, you know, really capturing the, the capacity of those units to look into that, into that back ravine, as well as to make an appropriate relationship to the residential uses, existing residential uses way on the other side of the ravine. And next, please. This shows you a section of the development where you can see that the parking for this for this structure is uh, partially buried below grade, uh, providing adequate parking for the three, four floors of residential uses above. Also to note here, because of this change in uses, we think we've been able to substantially improve the relationship of this building to the land. On the left-hand side, you can see in the right uh, kind of uh, diagram line there. That is the outline of the previous retaining walls and the height of the wall mark in the original PUD approval. And both because we've been able to push this building substantially back as well as lower it relative to its relationship to the grade, we've been able to reduce the existing retaining walls from three large ones to two smaller ones, as well as adding a substantial slope with landscaping and pushing the building back. Um, from the edge of the property line, which we think will make a substantial improvement to its relationship to the neighbors. Next, please. And the lastly, this is a view looking back towards Town Center Drive, where you can see the, the idea of this is as a um, plaza element that terminates landscape of drive. On the right-hand side, you see block two already on construction, nearly to be completed. Uh, immediately in the foreground on the right hand side is the is the medical office building and then on the left hand side you see our proposed residential stage one building um, really creating you know the terminus of that and that wonderful public space that terminates town Central drive I think that's the last one next please yeah and now I think I will turn it over to Dwight to talk about the medical office Thank you very much, Cheryl. Good afternoon, members of the commission. Uh, for the record, my name is Dwight Fincher. Uh, my address is 3915 Rick Over Road, Silver Spring, Maryland. I'm a principal with the firm of Wilmot Sands. We specialize in healthcare design nationally and internationally. It's all we do. And uh, I want to say that uh, one of our biggest joys is the opportunity to bring uh, healthcare into the community. Uh, and we're, we're very excited about this opportunity to bring uh, healthcare into an underserved community here in Ward 7. Uh, the uh, block one, as it's shown here on the site, uh, just to get you oriented, again, it fronts on the Naylor Road Southeast. It provides uh, a prominent portal or corner intersection into uh, the community itself. And um, next slide, please. A more detailed uh, site plan view of block one starts to show some of the unit, uh, amenity spaces that are a part of the medical office building. We see the vegetated roof, green roof, 
Uh, we also see a roof deck, uh, roof access, uh, which is designed specifically or uh, intentionally for uh, medical staff. Uh, it's, it's very important for those uh, folks we find have the opportunity to break and decompress and, and kind of get out of the high pressure situations that they find themselves in uh, quite frequently. Um, it also starts to show, or it does show the commitment to the sustainability uh, for the project with the PV solar array on top of the garage. Um, that's about 12,000 square feet of uh, PV solar array. And uh, besides being uh, uh, a sustain an innovative sus uh, sustainability um, uh, product or development, it actually uh, mitigates uh, some of the heat idle in effect by covering the cars and the deck on the top level of the garage. Um, one of the more important things though, I think you can see um, with uh, this project is it's, it's a four-sided building. Um, there's architecture on every side that, that, uh, that faces the community. There's everything is on stage and there's no back of house uh, to this project. And that's, that was our major focus and with a special attention towards Naylor Road. Um, one of the keys to success of this will be the access for patients and visibility for the project. We've designed it with a through lobby that's accessed on the pedestrian side from Nava Road adjacent to conveniently adjacent to the bus stop. And on the back side is the patient drop off and circulation point to the, the medical building. And we've what we've done is internalized this space and taken this vehicle activity off the street and internalized it within in the um, within the, the uh, uh, auto court uh, with the least disruption and visual exposure to the surrounding neighbors. On the left-hand side, you can see that the uh, service and loading is fully screened in, in an enclosed uh, two-berth uh, uh, truck dock. Uh, next slide, please. The other key to this uh, success of this project uh, and speaks to the uses that this brings to the community in terms of medical service We've designed it around what is called a flexible chassis. It's a, it's a module we developed to allow the greatest variety and, and flexibility in terms of different modalities that can be, occupy the space. So it's, uh, it's very flexible in terms, it can run the range from individual physician practices, multi-practices through uh, academic and hospital-based clinics that take up full floors. Um, it's designed for structural flexibility to bring in such modalities as, as um, imaging, for example, or, or urgent care. Uh, what you see here is an example, uh, a hypothetical example of a, a tenant layout plan. This happens to be six units that focus on um, an example for exam and, and clinical layouts. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, we talked about one of the keys to success is, is the contextual service and the contextual fit. As we started to develop this project and work preliminary with preliminary designs with OP back and forth, the idea was to create a, a project. The, the goal is, or part T is twofold, to create a project that fits within the community, but also distinguishes itself in terms of its purpose and uh, its program for what it does, its, its position in the community. So the way we did that is we had some traditional forms that we utilized that, that you see reminiscent or that reflects back to some of the more historical elements um, in the existing community. And we locate those at significant points in the, in the building design. Most of the building itself, the base part of it to make it again, more distinct is we follow kind of a, 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 her, a more industrial uh, standardized uh, fenestration uh, aesthetic to it. Um, uh, again, it's, it's uh, less stylized and, and with little ornamentation uh, but that's, again, an effort to distinguish uh, itself and its place in the community. And then finally, we blend the use of modern or conventional materials, such as brick masonry, uh, with uh, uh, modern materials, uh, glass and aluminum. And that kind of conveys this sense of uh, a state-of-the-art delivery of care uh, that, that hospital providers or clients uh, uh, like to, uh, that's the face they like to put forward. Uh, the next slide, please. So this starts to show how we incorporate uh, all that into the elevations. We're going to walk through uh, uh, the four elevations, prominent elevations, but probably the most 
prominent or most important is the west elevation on the top. This is the one that faces Naylor Road. This was, again, there was back and forth. We worked with the OP on this, but the significant takeaways from this, I think, are the, the prominent corner element. We treat that, uh, the change in materials obviously signifies that as a special, a special feature. And what our intent is to design that as a wayfinding element for patients uh, into the community and to uh, identify the front entry or front door, have a clear front door. It also works as kind of a portal into this in, into the community from this section, and it anchors this urban corner with this with this corner porch as we develop developed it with the site plan. On the left hand side of the west elevation, you see the garage, and where there's been uh, we spent a great deal of time and effort to try to work uh, with OP and, and make efforts to. Uh, integrate this design into the, the facade and into the neighborhood uh, in a way that that creates a pleasing uh, aesthetic. Uh, we borrow some of the architecture, the verticality of the bays from the existing building. Obviously, we borrow similar materials. We actually introduce uh, um, metal uh, grill work that actually mimics the proportions of the windows in the building and helps to break down the scale of the garage, as well as, as, as screen some of the precast features of the garage behind it itself. On the top, you can see the uh, solar array starts to mimic the, the hierarchy of, of, of the uh, attic story of the um, medical building itself. The lower level is uh, the east elevation. This is the back side with the auto court approach. And I think what this starts to show, again, this is the back side of the building, but the architecture goes all the way around it. It's consistent, so there's no drop off, and again, no back of house uh, look to the uh, uh, architecture itself. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the south elevation, again, off coming in off Naylor Road, headed towards Town Center Drive. Um, we actually punctuate this elevation with kind of a lowercase corner element off the end uh, to to kind of create again some visual variety and to uh, create that special corner or announce that corner. And then on the north elevation, this particular elevation doesn't face the neighborhoods of the public. This, this actually uh, faces uh, green space, but we returned the uh, Naylor Road architectural design for the garage back uh, two full bays uh, from the garage on this uh, to, um, have a more positive impact on that view, view corridor as you're coming down there. Uh, next slide, please. Again, a little more detail, the exterior materials, it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. The conventional materials are two colors of brick, a darker at the attic story, and then the field brick of a, a reddish warm uh, buff color. And then the introduction of uh, aluminum a rain screen uh, materials and, and, and aluminum spandrels. We've created uh, to create some differentiation on the lower floor. Um, we designed it to read as a two story volume by introducing a metal spandrel um, at that uh, first floor line. And that helps increase the, the verticality of the design, we believe, and adds again some more visual interest. The examples on the right are some examples of the aluminum rain screen panel that we propose for the corner elements in the stairs. Um, next slide. Next slide, please. Excuse me, can we move move on to the next slide, please? It looks like Paul's uh spinning for a second. Oh, okay. Well, again, a little more discussion. What we show here too, you start to see the painted aluminum equipment, equipment screen on top of the roof. This is actually set 30 feet back. So I think when you look at this in perspective, you'll see that that, that is barely visible, if at all, from most of the views. Um, the, uh, the, the storefront system and storefront windows are all consistent in size. Again, that's that, that harkens back to that more standardized 
um, kind of warehouse, almost warehouse aesthetic um, that, we're, um, that we're trying to create there. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so what we start to look at now as uh, we understood through uh, working with OP, how um, important, again, this treatment of the garage was. So I think what we wanted to, we went back and forth with several studies and, you know, how do we animate this space at the, at the ground level, I think was everybody's concern. How do we create um, um, something besides just a garage at the ground level? So we, we, we went through uh, several design studies, but one of the things that we, we, we committed to was pushing the, the major body of the garage almost 24 feet back from the front and creating a single story element out front on the lower level that you see on view A. This is the view across the street from uh, uh, on Naylor Road. And what you see there is we developed our idea of what we're proposing is an actual art amenity that is a, uh, a display window system where rotating or changing um, visual arts or community uh, installations or, or community art can be uh, 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 exhibited um, on an ongoing basis to, um, again, provide visual interest and, and just as a, as a community function and purpose. And, and um, I think this has some tremendous opportunity to add visual interest at that lower level and the arts walk. In addition, we want to give a, uh, a realistic uh, view of what the uh, solar panels look like from the street level. So the two views on the right indicate uh, looking up from the sidewalk and kind of give you an idea of where they sit in relationship to the facade and actually the front face of the building. Next slide, please. And again, I uh, wanted to go a little bit further and we cut a section through the garage. Uh, a big concern of ours was obviously how the garage impacted the neighbors, especially across the street. So our goal was to uh, mitigate any uh, problems with the lighting of the headlights of the vehicles, the lightings of the, the lighting of the garage as well. The, the lighting that's that's not hidden by the structures itself will be hidden by full cutoff shrouds attached to the lighting. The exterior uh, barrier wall for the garage is 42 inches high. Well, uh, plenty high enough to uh, cut off the uh, headlight uh, from the cars parking in, and circulating in the garage. The section also shows you on the uh, bottom, bottom side, essentially what that 36 inch deep art display window uh, looks like and its relationship to the building services and building service corridor uh, that we're hiding at the, at the lower level. Um, and again, the views on the right show you um, again, the coverage of the uh, solar panels to the top deck. Again, we talked about reducing the heat idle effect there as a plus, and then the height of the, uh, the barrier walls to shield the headlights. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the next three views are our perspectives that uh, we're putting in here to, to again, as uh, illustrations to show the scale and, and the buildings fit into the community. This is obviously the intersection of Naylor Road and the entrance to the site. The major corner element, again, is uh, a, an anchor porch, a corner anchor, an urban anchor, as well as a wayfinding element for patients to identify and have a visual landmark of where this healthcare medical facility is. Next slide. This view is on Town Center uh, Drive looking north. So you're coming down um, from the uh, access road into the site. You'd make a left turn and then you would drive into the vehicle access courtyard for the medical office building. You see uh, a little bit of view of the garage poking out from beyond. Uh, but again, most of that, that vehicle activity is, is hidden from the neighborhoods and, and they circulate from the drop off directly back into the garage without having to come back out on the street and go into the garage. Next slide. And then finally, this is a, a more direct view from an uh, elevated view of what that auto court looks like. And so you, you get a clear idea how deep uh, that vehicle activity takes place into the, uh, into the courtyard itself and then the circulation back to the garage. This is the, the, the final view, but gives you an idea also that uh, 
again, the architecture continues all the way around uh, uh, this this four sided building. Great, that, thanks, Dwight. Uh, so, Erwin. Okay, great. Uh, Good afternoon, Chairman Hood, members of the commission. Uh, for the record, Erwin Andrus with Grove Slate Associates. Uh, we've been involved with the project since the inception and uh, we've been involved over 10 years. So with that, I'll go quickly through my slides to uh, discuss the transportation aspects of the uh, project. Uh, the site location uh, is, is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, there are some uh, significant uh, bus uh, infrastructure that serves the site. Next slide. Uh, this is just a summary of the development program. Uh, in essence, uh, what's being swapped out is uh, uh, the retail is being uh, reduced uh, and the, uh, the, the inclusion of medical office and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and the reduction in parking spaces, uh, which is the critical element of the plan. Next slide. With respect to the program itself, uh, I, I believe uh, Cheryl and Dwight did a good job of identifying what's being proposed for all of the individual blocks. Uh, this shows it uh, with respect to the internal circulation. Next slide. And uh, these are the specific elements. Uh, I think what'll be uh, what's uh, pretty clear is, and especially in the yellow boxes, is that there's been significant uh, infrastructure improvements uh, that have been. Uh, that have been constructed and are currently under construction to support the site. Uh, and we've coordinated with all of those improvements and mitigations uh, in our coordination with TDOT. Next slide. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, 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 similar to the, uh, the, the uh, slide that Cheryl uh, showed, uh, which uh, identifies the circulation and how all of the individual entrances and the loading activity takes place. Next slide. And uh, this is a trip generation. Uh, as we had mentioned, uh, based on the, uh, the trips uh, associated with the previously approved PUD and this mod uh, modification of significance, essentially we are reducing the traffic uh, significantly on both uh, the weekends and the evenings uh, because we are reducing the retail, uh, which peaks uh, in the evenings on, and, and on the weekends. And we are slightly increasing the, the traffic in, uh, during the morning peak hours. Next slide. And then uh, this is a breakdown of the parking supply, uh, as been uh, as uh, as was presented earlier. Uh, as part of the approved PUD, uh, we uh, were approved up to fourteen hundred six spaces. Uh, given the reconfiguration of the uh, of the lots and the blocks and the uh, change in use, we are actually reducing the number of spaces on site uh, by about one hundred seventeen spaces. Next slide. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are significant uh, a number of improvements uh, that have been identified and that have been implemented. Uh, well, uh, and the value of those are well over a million dollars uh, and have, uh, have improved the access into the, the site and providing more porosity and circulation through the site. And this is just a, uh, a listing of the approved PUD improvements. And if you have any questions, I can go into those uh, with, in, uh, into a little more detail. Next slide. And uh, DDOT recommendations. So uh, essentially uh, in DDOT's review letter, uh, they identified uh, several uh, mitigations, uh, especially in the updating of TDM. Uh, we agree to all of them, except for the second sub bullet, which is highlighted in blue. And as of a few minutes uh, leading up to this hearing, actually that sub second sub bullet has changed. Uh, we've uh, worked out uh, an agreement with DDOT uh, to uh, not only meet their uh, uh, sort of meet their initiatives with respect to TDM, uh, but we've also included uh, many other elements as part of their enhanced tier and their baseline tier of TDM elements, uh, which I can go into uh, a little, little more, a little bit more detail uh, if the uh, commission uh, uh, wants to ask questions related to that. Uh, but our intention is to uh, submit a, a post hearing. Uh, list of TDM, uh, uh, a list of TDM measures that we have agreed to with DDOT, and they concur that those are appropriate uh, for this um, PUD modification. Uh, so, with that, I'm uh, available for questions. Thank you. I think we will have our last um, 
uh, speaker, and that's Brad Fennell from W.C. Smith. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Brad Fennell, executive vice president of W.C. Smith, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to appear before you this, at this hearing. My role this afternoon is to provide an update of the project's community benefits and to summarize our community outreach and support. I'd like to start by sharing our performance on hiring district residents and businesses through our first source and CBE commitments for this project. To date, we've generated 121 new jobs, 96 of which are district residents with 56 of the 96 residing east of the river. We also received credit for employing 159 transfers who are also district residents. As for CBEs, we are on track to spend more than 43 million with qualified contractors and will exceed the 35% requirement imposed by the district's CBE program. With regard to community benefits and amenities, this project has been ongoing for many years and with the initial phase opening later this year, we have already provided many of the benefits and amenities negotiated in the project. It is important to note that while we are proposing a reallocation of some line items that were anticipated but not necessary from the original PUD. We are not reallocating any money from schools and libraries or diminishing our sponsorship of local community events and programs. We are rebalancing three of the line items and reflecting an overall increase of $200,000 to our community benefits. In addition, it's worth noting that we have also completed significant infrastructure improvements in the area around Skyland Town Center. In particular, I would like to highlight the contributions to and the work of the Skyland Workforce Center, a work program of building bridges, a Ward 8 nonprofit. This effort began in 2014 when the development team, wanting to break the typical scenario of a construction trailer opening on site with a sign reading, not hiring, launched a collaborative initiative to open a transformative job training center. We secured a retail lease across the street from Skyland and now fit it as a fully functioning training center. Building Bridges staffed and coordinated multiple nonprofits to provide content and services focused on meeting every individual where they are and assisting those individuals with their goals to obtain or advance their individual opportunities through life skills and job training. To date, we have contributed more than $650,000 to the Skyland Workforce Center which has gone way beyond the $75,000 we originally pledged in the benefits package. The center has produced impressive results. They have served an average of 800 job seekers each year and completed intake for over 5,000 community members. They've placed over 560 people in jobs and not just construction jobs, though they have placed over 30 people at the Skylands project. And they continue to provide services remotely during this pandemic reaching vulnerable population with information, assessment, and training during a very unstable and critical time in our history. For these reasons, we have requested to reallocate the funding of certain benefits and amenities that are no longer relevant to this project. First is the contractor loan fund of 300,000, which hasn't been necessary because of timely funding of contractor invoices. And second is the home buying home ownership class of 75,000 which we are no longer find relevant for the project, given that there are no ownership units. We propose to reallocate those dollars to the Skyland Workforce Center. Given the overwhelming success of this program and the time and money invested in it, this is the hallmark benefit of the Skyland Town Center, and this reallocation appropriately recognizes that investment. Lastly, I'd like to address the community outreach and support. The Skyland Task Force was formed as a direct link with the community to provide regular updates regarding the project. This was in coordination with the community during the earlier years of the project. Since that time, we've been meeting regularly for years and regarding the project status and providing information to that outlet. The Skyland Task Force recently submitted a letter of support for this application. In regards to ANC 7B, we met last summer to provide an update on the project and present the application. <clears throat> we appreciate the ongoing work of the ANC for the project, present, and we um, took their comments and presented again at a June meeting. And the ANC recently submitted a, a letter of support uh, after that June meeting. 
With the exception of a letter filed by a single community member regarding our request for re reallocation of some of the community benefits, there are no known oppositions to this modification application, and we stand very proudly presenting it before you tonight and feel that this is the future of the Skyland project. The application that we presented this afternoon is the culmination of a significant commitment in time, energy, and dollars on behalf of the entire Skyland team. And as Gary opened uh, earlier uh, in this hearing, it's been a 20 year endeavor to try to bring the fruition of Skylands to the community. We stand as committed today as ever, and we're very excited to be presenting this and we all stand ready to answer your questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brad. That, in, that concludes our presentation and we thank you for your indulgence as we went a little bit over. And as Brad said, we're available to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you. That's fine. I, I really appreciate uh, the, uh, the testimony and the um, letting us know what what the changes are and how we move forward. And I would say, Mr. Fennell, this this hearing, this particular case, started off a lot better than what you mentioned the last time. I, as soon as I heard your name, I have to be frankly honest. I probably shouldn't say this, but so I said, I hope I don't hear the same start that I heard the last time. It really got me depressed. So I, I really appreciate the the forwardness that you all are doing, especially on this project and, and even the other one as well. Uh, let me open it up to uh, my colleagues. Um, Commissioner May, you have any questions or comments? I do. Uh, first of all, my, my first question is for Mr. Young. Mr. Young, are you hearing the whistling of my fan on the microphone? Paul Young, can you hear my fan? Just a little bit. I can. We can hear just a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Little if bit. we talk louder, we talk I, I, louder. That's all very interesting. But I was looking for Mr. Young's opinion. Oh, oh, oh! Excuse me. <laughs> all right. Just, just want to make sure they're not. It's not whistling at everybody. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I do have a few questions. Um, so first of all, I, I I have seen that the the project, uh, the drawings and the images that we see, it's all improved, I think, substantially from what we saw at set down. Um, but I do have a few questions. So I see that you did resolve the loading and trash issue um, in the in the parking area, uh, but maybe you want to bring up slide nine and sort of explain to me exactly where the loading and trash went. I can pull it up and I can also hear the fan a little louder now. At first, it wasn't so loud. How's that? I can still hear it, but that sounds better. All right. I'm going to like put it right up to my face. OK, thank you. Sorry, the fan is necessary to keep my computer from overheating. Um, OK, slide nine. Cheryl? Yeah. So the, um, the the trash and loading for the the Lidl is all in this service court, which is screened by walls on all four sides. That's access and entrance into it. And so that all happens removed from the service parking lot or from the neighbors. This is right. the loading bay for both the inline retail and the Starbucks. There is an internal location for the dumpster in the inline retail which is both for the inline retail and the Starbucks. And for the Starbucks, there is a controlled path across the drive aisle here and into that loading bay. Dumpster location for the so Starbucks. A controlled, a controlled path from the inline re retail, from where to where? From the, from the Starbucks for the purpose of trash. You know, they, they take it out of the service location here there's a path here that goes over to this island here, uh, all the way over to here. And then there's a crosswalk yeah. here that gets them to we, the inline retail. Sarah, we can't see the here and the here and the here. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. So, sorry, I'm showing on my. So the service bay Don't for worry. the Starbucks is towards the front of the building on Alabama Avenue. There's a door there into a um, pathway, a sidewalk that gets them from the front of the building across to the island that's on the other side of the drive aisle. 
Yeah. I go left across that island, across the drive aisle, into the sidewalk in front of the inline retail. There is an enclosed dumpster inside of the inline retail building in which the, the trash is placed. It will be pulled out um, to be delivered to the loading bay that's indicated there um, in the drawing um, for trash pickup. And that is all the, also the loading bay for both the inline retail and the service. And Cheryl, when we did the, when we did the math, how, how long did that walk, for lack of a better term? Can can I say not far? <laughs> I, I, if if I remember correctly, we did the walk for those Starbucks employees to get it over to the in real in the retail building was not that much further than the walk we had them previously doing to put it in the dumpster in the uh, parking lot. And so I'm I'm less concerned about the that walk. I mean, it, it, having the the trash. Uh, and the loading in the middle of the parking lot was problematic. Um, right. Having it here, I mean, I, I assume that since you're already talking about Starbucks specifically, they've seen the plans. They know what they're going to have to grapple with in terms of the trash generation and and so on. So I I I, mean, I, I assume that's all that's all more or less worked out. It's mostly about kind of what it looks like. Is there an image of what the that side the uh, the parking lot side of the inline retail building what that's like so I didn't see that maybe I missed it in the plans well there's we want to go way to the end 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 of the presentation oh yeah okay there were those extra slides weren't there yeah well if you keep go, going going oh, I got it okay I see it there on, on well, page 59. I'll say is the back of the building is like this. It's just there's yeah, one screen view. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Screen bay. Yeah. That's it. It just worked in as a bay. Okay. Good. Yeah. I hadn't uh, hadn't gotten that far in that. All right. So that helps. Um, the uh, you uh, you know uh, the the loading for the Lidl, um I know you had started out with like walls, masonry walls as high as 18 feet. I mean, but now there's just a single wall that's 13 feet and it's between there and the neighbors. That makes more sense. But is that just, um, that's just to make sure that the loading is not visible to neighbors across the way? Yes, it's to screen the, the height of the trucks. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. Um, so can we go to slide 24? Yeah, so, um, and this is the one with the, where we see the section and I see, you know, it's, it's a little bit less of a wedding cake uh, than it was before. Uh, and there were three sections of, of uh, retaining wall. Now there are two that are a little bit taller. Um, what is the material of that, of those walls? The, the material will be some kind of faceted um, structure there. There will be planting that screens those walls. Okay. So, it, I mean, is it going to be a, it, it essentially going to be like a laid up block thing? Or is it going to be a pre, I mean, a cast uh, wall? It will, it will not be cast. It will be some kind of laid up block. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, And the heights of any of those individual sections, it looks to be, what, 15 or 18 feet, something like that? Yeah, I mean, if you wanted more precise dimensions, we could provide those. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, what I'm really curious about is what it will look like from across the way. Um, surprisingly, we don't have the neighbors from Fort Baker Drive uh, here in force, or at least they haven't submitted anything to the record and they were very vocal in the initial approval and one of the concerns was to understand what it looked like from across the way. Um, you don't, do you have anything that shows a view from Fort Baker or for, from those houses? We do not today. We can provide it if you would like. 
It yeah, is I, it is gentler. Yeah. I mean, I can see the benefits of, of what you've done here. I mean, certainly there's more room for, or it looks like there's room for trees at the top of that wall, which is a better circumstance. Um, because they are taller expanses of wall, uh, which are not themselves objectionable. It kind of depends on how visible they are. Uh, so, all right. Um, let's see. Oh, um, on block F, um, we need to bring up the, the overall site plan. No, block four, sorry. Block four. Um, yeah, okay. So, the, yeah, just that site, actually, we have it right here. At the bottom there, there's a, a roadway running all the way around the building. Yeah. What is the purpose of that roadway? Is that... Is there it's just, just it's service drive and fire access only. It's service drive and fire access. And it is necessary for fire access. You can't just... It is. It is. It. The building's too long. Yeah, okay. And... Um, and and there won't be any any uh, there will be any parking back there. No, yeah. it is it is strictly uh, utilitarian for fire access and okay. service for the courtyards and all that. Yeah, have you have you looked in the possibility of it being uh, a reinforced turf or something like that? We can, we can look into that. It does not necessarily have to be a paved roadway. Yeah, um, I I have seen that sort of an application done before. I know that there are some. Yeah. Uh, government facilities where we've done things like that just to be able to make sure we have fire access if that's the only purpose of it it would be better than than asphalt um I, but it's there are trade-offs I, I understand so if you could look at that that would be great okay. um and um so uh, i just had a couple of questions about the uh uh the medical office building and the parking garage Yes. So um, maybe we could go to, um, well, this is a simple one, page 40. All right, so this is a little odd, but on the right-hand side there where you see the floors of the uh, parking garage, it looks, I mean, the one that's like closest to your eye line, eyesight, uh, looks like it's cranked upwards as it comes toward you. I assume that's just a glitch in the drawing, right? Well, it's a slope, it's a slope deck. Um, it is, are you talking about the fact that it-, it Oh, so it's sloped it, on this side too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought it, it was sloped on, on, the, uh, on the other side. It slopes on both sides. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It has well, a helix garage, so. Yeah. Um, do, we don't actually have a sort of section elevation that cuts right through like and and then looks to the uh uh looks at the at the uh parking garage do we uh, a section through the garage or a section well, through no, the a section through the building but then it captures oh. the elevation of the garage there well no, well not in this particular presentation but i do have that that view yeah is that in the fire. drawing set that i missed it uh yes it uh, i believe it would be but uh i'll confirm that yeah, if it's not, I mean, I'll, I'll look for it when I'm done talking, and, and if I can't find okay. it, um, we might need to have that submitted. Um, and then, um, yeah, this is sort of a deceptive view because we're looking at it from a slightly aerial perspective, and it looks like a, the, the parking garage is just kind of funky. It doesn't look like it's sloping. Um, then if we could go to page 38. Okay, so, um, and maybe we could actually, um, Paul, can you zoom in uh, toward the top of that corner piece? Yeah, a little closer. So what what are we seeing there? Is it is there a, I mean, is it's a sort of a layering of these metal, vertical metal panels? 
yeah, it, it's it's a layering of the rain screen system, trying to pick up on on the the, the, the vocabulary. It's kind of an art modern or, or deco vocabulary that that is kind of sprinkled throughout the uh, the yeah. other developments. And, and, and so it's an aluminum screen wall, basically an architectural development. <laughs> That sure, and then and the uh, at the very top in the center sections, there's something that's a either a lighter color or it's translucent. Uh, no, it's actually just a lighter color, not translucent, uh, and it's really just to set the contrast off for the kind of crenellation of the top yeah. piece. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I, I it, it it feels a little awkward and odd um and not very tower like it feels um it feels sort of overly heavy compared to the um relative lightness of what's below it so i i, I don't know what to suggest in particular but um i think you might take another look at that and see if you can come up with a top that's a little bit um I don't know that, that that fits a little bit more. Uh, that is because I I feel like some of that um, the layering is, you know, can can get lost, and and having the tower pieces sort of recede like that, um, I'm not sure is the best move. Um, I, don't know. I would just take a take another look at it and see if there's. Um, I feel like it's 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 not as good as it could be. I'm not I'm not losing sleep over how this looks, but it just feels like it's um, it's kind of awkward and not not very well resolved. Let's say so. So the crown piece specifically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really, it's that it's that piece. Um, I mean, I almost feel like it's if it doesn't need to be that tall, maybe it shouldn't be that tall because part of the problem has to do with the distance between the. Window openings and the the sort of quasi crenellation at the top. Mm -hmm. So, um, but anyway, I mean, I would encourage you to look at that a little bit more. Um, and I think um, I guess I have one last question, which goes back to something I mentioned before, which is the um, the neighbors on Fort Baker Drive. And I'm wondering if there was explicit outreach to those neighbors, given their past interest in the in the project. Yes, yeah, so um, we have um, submitted our materials to um, Ms. Harris. Uh, and um, what's interesting, truly, this project and also the last couple of times that we have been before uh, the Zoning Commission two years ago, three years ago on modifications to Block 2, um, there was just no real response back from um, the Fort Baker Drive neighbors, the party in the original application. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, I, I think that um, since it happened over so many years that what sticks in my mind is their initial concern yeah. about the fact that they've not been as, as concerned or at least not speaking up. So thank you very much. I appreciate the fact that you're doing the outreach. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Mr. Shapiro. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few uh, minor questions and then Mr. Chair, there's a number of issues that were uh, brought up in our uh, um, advice from the Office of Attorney General. I'm not sure what the best time to bring that up is. Is that now, or do we want to hear from OP and then bring it up? How do you want to handle that? Uh, you can, if you want to, you can bring that up uh, at this point. Uh, I, I'll wait until my turn to comment on all that. Yeah, you can go ahead and bring it up. Okay, thanks. So the the minor ones I had, first of all, the, I don't remember which slide it is, but the garage stairwell, the glass garage stairwell. Um, I'm just curious about what that's facing and and um, how much light is going to be coming off that thing, and are there houses across the street from it? I just can't remember. I just was noting the big glass lit uh, stairwell. There, there are two stairwell locations. Again, the glass uh, we feel provides uh, an element of security uh, and visibility within the stairwell. Um, I agree with that. Um, I, I'm just wondering about if there's going to be any uh, negative impact on the neighbors from the light that comes from it. 
Mm -hmm. I just don't even know if it's a, even an issue because it, it wasn't clear to me what it's facing. Well, I'm not sure I'd want to be living across from a, a brightly lit glass stairwell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we could certainly look into the level of limit illumination in terms of, uh, you know, what the minimum required is. The intent was not for it to be a beacon or lantern uh, in terms of that, but, uh, but we can also address that in terms of um, uh, window coatings, uh, specialized window coatings. Spandrel coatings, glass coatings to diffuse them well. Well, perhaps too, Mr. Young, if you could pull up the uh, presentation and maybe off the top of my head, is it, was it perhaps slide 39? And again, if, it, if, it's, not, if it's not facing anything that it's right, where right. it's relevant, then it doesn't matter. Right. So if we look at so good, and maybe, maybe it was 40, sorry. Well, yeah. There you go, right? So this is a view from block four. These would be the new, and probably these would be the most impacted folks. These are, would be, I would imagine, and I'm gonna ask Cheryl, probably you're on the third, third floor probably of the block four and you have a unit that faces onto Town Center Drive. Yes, that's about where this is from. So I, I it, please look into that. Uh, I don't know how much light that puts off. I don't know what the impact would be from the housing across the street from it. Uh, but I, I think it's at least worth looking into. I think you're right. I think we can provide that element of security with without opening up all the walls and the stairs. So, and, but security is security is important. So right, so you'll you'll find the balance. Um, so other question. Uh, by the way, thank you for the. The PV array and the garage rooftop and the its protection for cars, uh, the the heat island effect, all that it it, it looks great the way you've designed it. Um, another thing related to the garage, you, the art wall that you have uh, presented, which I think was a lovely idea. Is it, can you pull up that slide real quick? That thirty six inch wall on the exterior of the garage. You'll have to tell Paul what slide it is. I don't remember. I'm sorry. I didn't take right. notes. Yeah. Commissioner May, I have to learn from you and take notes on the slides I'm referring to. Mr. Young, probably maybe say it's 37. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going one more. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's good enough. So how are those access? Are they access from the front? No, they're access from the backside. There will be a series of swing opening doors that uh, front to the service quarter itself that that service quarter serves the support spaces and mechanical rooms for the for the project itself the okay. project. that's helpful to hear and also how is it ventilated well we haven't really got to that point yet um but i mean that certainly will be a consideration i would make it a pretty significant consideration because if those things are not ventilated well and it's hot out they are going to they're going to steam up or something bad's going to happen in there and it's going to look very unattractive. Well, so, it will be. Yeah, we would propose mechanical ventilation. I mean, it wouldn't be, you know, just a, a relief vent uh, for that space. And you're right, it's a Western exposure, so that should be considered. Okay, all right. That's all. I just wanted to flag that for those. Um, so then there's a number of issues, Mr. Tummins, a number of issues uh, that have been, that, uh, come from our notes from OAG related to how we should take up this case. And I, I don't know the extent of the conversations that have been had already, uh, but let me lay out some of them. The, 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 the key issue is um, that this, that, you know, what is it that we're looking to approve here? What, what's, what is first stage and what is second stage uh, PUD? The key issue for us is to determine which elements of this, if any, are first stage PUD portions of the approved consolidated uh, PUD, uh, and and how we, you know, how we measure that, and it's not clear to me from your presentation um, how you're distinguishing between those two, um, but we have to treat them differently. So this this is this is not to do with the, I. Let me just say, I, I love this project. I love the way it's designed. I had some concerns even at set down about 
or are we converting this to more of a suburban style development? I, I think this has been well integrated, um, but the legal issues, I wanna make sure we address those appropriately. Okay, so maybe if we go to, uh, Ms. Young, we put that over slide, and we go to, I'm gonna guess, let's try slide three, which is the site plan or early on in the process. Uh, Maybe keep. I mean, do you do you agree or disagree that there? Here we go. That, go that there are substantial changes that uh, appear to impact aspects of the first stage PUD approval. Well, maybe I'd say so. I think because of so, I would sort of say this is I. I fully believe this is a modification of consequence. Right. We had a first. We had a consolidated PUD. Uh, that had multiple blocks, including block two, and but probably more importantly, with that initial uh, PUD application, we established Town Center Drive, and we established all of the, uh, if you will, the mitigation impacts of the infrastructure that we did along Alabama and Good Hope and Naylor Road. We worked with this new modification of significance application within that confine. Right, we looked at and we established with that initial PUD, these are the major entry points into this project. Those have not changed. What has changed is how we've internally done that. So I would say when we look at this slide, to us it is we are modifying that original PUD, which we think is valid, and that we are saying, okay, so with regards to block three, we are treating this as a consolidated PUD in that we are seeking approval of, we've done the full architecture, uh, all of the elements that we would normally require in a consolidated PUD, we have done those for blocks one and for block three. With regards to the block four, we are asking that that just be the first stage PUD approval. In that, as uh, Ms. O'Neill noted, we are looking for approval of the height density uses with the idea that we will come back for second stage approval for block four with the complete architecture, with the information that uh, uh, Commissioner May talked about, what is the appearance going to be of those retaining walls that are facing the Fort Baker Drive? What is the landscape plan that is gonna be on the top of those uh, retaining walls? So I think, I think that's, because, that's why I believe that the way we've done this is appropriate. Modification of significance of an existing PUD, and then these two consolidated portions and a stage one portion. And maybe I guess, then I'll put it back, is the question somehow that we need to consider this to be a completely new PUD, that this is not 09-03F, but it is 19-something? Was that the concern? I think we're not, and and what I'm what I'm reading is not that we're that there's even a suggestion that you would need to start over as a brand new stage uh, first stage PUD. No, but but what we need to evaluate as elements that are changes to the first stage PUD, and what are what do we need to evaluate that are elements of changes to the second stage PUD, and we have to treat them differently. Thomas, let me just interrupt. Yeah. I think the quickest way, because when I look at the relief, I, I think it's very simple, but I think the quickest way we can do is to um, kind of put it like a cheat sheet together for us so we'll know uh, exactly what I think Commissioner Shapiro is, is stating. Is, um, like, a, okay, what, what do we include? Like block three, and this is part of what we believe part of, uh, just kind of exactly what you spoke about. And if you could do that in the format of a cheat sheet, like soundbite, sure. I think it's not, all over the place and dribbles. Uh, I think yeah. it's one place that we can sit down and put our eyes on one sheet and understand exactly what's going on. Perfect. We can do that in a post hearing submission. Absolutely. But they, that gets to a piece of it, Mr. Chair. But then there are other issues that were brought up, very specific issues that that I want to make sure they come before Mr. Tumman so that we can get answers on it as well. Um, you know, for instance, uh looking at trying to make sure that i'm covering all the bases here which block is this 
I think it's block four. Um, so in block four, uh, is there a portion of this proposed building, uh, which is being built on the portion of the property that's the generalized policy Mac designated as neighborhood conservation area? And that the flum designates for low density residential. So, exactly what is block four sitting on? Right, right. Well, I would say, I mean, in some ways, and again, if we we're saying that this is a previous, maybe what we can do and, and answer that question is to say this was previously a portion of block four included a Walmart, right? So, in the initial PUD, where we have, I would say, the two, the two left uh, most, if you will, uh, wings of the block four building. That was the Walmart, and so I think you know we have uh, you know some issues of are we going back to you know revisit what is uh, appropriate for development and where development is occurring on this site. And I think as we've shown too with the section cutting across, this building block four is set back further from the property line. Than the initial buildings uh, that were approved as a full consolidated PUD. Um, but I hear you, and I think in some regards, um, this is going to be difficult for us, and as I said, me to do on the fly without having these questions um, posed. So maybe I know it's a little awkward uh, in this virtual setting, but it is in a post hearing submission uh, if we can say the applicant will address. The concerns raised by the office of the attorney general, then Ms. Ridding and I, uh, and uh, Ms. Hodel Cox, we can. Understand all of the questions that are raised and provide answers to those questions. Well, I, that makes sense to me. I'm from Mr. Riddick. Does that work for you? Uh, or do we need to get is it your sense that we need to get this on the record now and get all these issues out there? Uh, in this hearing before that happens. Hi, um, my name for the record is, is Jacob Ridding. Um, uh, given the complexity of these issues, um, I think maybe um, a written submission would probably be the best way to deal with them rather than try to do this at the hearing on the fly, uh, as Mr. Tummins suggested. Um, so, um, I'm willing to have a conversation with Mr. Tummins uh, at the close of the hearing um, to fuller provide a fuller explanation of what his responsive submission should be, um, and I think that would be acceptable. Thank you, because because he'll he'll need to know what the written submission is responding to. Uh, so that makes sense. And then there are other issues that were brought up related to the PD balancing test and. The public benefits, but I think all the all the piece all the elements that we have in our notes, you'll be able to cover with Mr. Tummins. Yes, and and just so there is a, a discussion of it on the record at the hearing, I could summarize them very shortly. The first is consistency of block four with the generalized policy map and flum guidance for a portion of the site. Um, the second has to do with um, um, the um, number of housing units, because there was a discrepancy between what was in the OP report and in the applicant submissions. The right. OP report said 420 units. The applicant says 515. Um, the third has to do with the IZ commitment and um, whether the applicant intends block four to comply with current iz requirements whether the units will be home ownership or rentals uh and that's that's it uh, and i'm willing to expand on those um in a conversation with mr tummins and i, I appreciate your indulgence perfect yeah so I just don't see my we can absolutely address those um i think number two um, in our conversation with um, Ms. Robert from the Office of Planning, I think the issue of the number of units in the OP report will be addressed then. Um, and yeah, we can, the other two issues we can address. 
Okay, and I think, you know, this, it, I imagine you'll hear this from my colleagues, it goes without saying this has a, been a long time coming and we wanna, and this, this is a project that we wanna help move along. So the goal here isn't to slow it down, the goal is to get it right. Agreed. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Turnbull. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this project's been going around for a while. For a while. Uh, it seems to me when we started, we, we talked about community a little while ago, and we talked about the Fort Baker people. And it seems to me when we did this, I might be wrong, but didn't we end up doing, a, didn't the applicant have to do a balloon test? Didn't we do a test where you had to find the height of the building so what, what they could see? Seems to remember, yes. if we did it once, we did it twice. Yes, yeah. there was the first one, the balloons were popping and there were all these yeah. trees on the site and it was, yeah. Yeah, we finally worked that through. I think we got satisfactory approval from the residents. I think they felt comfortable with what, what they were gonna get. Um, I think this is gonna be a, a very stimulating project. I think it's got a lot a lot going for it. And I think it's gonna be a worthy investment in the community. And um, but let me go let me go back and touch on uh, Go back on what Mr. Shapiro said about the um, uh, the garage and the stairway, it, and I would agree. It, it seems to me that this can all be addressed with either the type of lighting, the style of lighting that you're going to put in, whether it's down lighting, hidden lighting. I think the glass and the material. So, I definitely think that if we if you could address that and take a look at some options as to what that stairwell or stairwells will look like. I think I think it can be dealt with, and in such a way that will not be offensive. But I think it's a architectural issue that needs to be carefully looked at. It's electrical lighting issue, so I think I think we can deal with that. And I think I would follow up on that. The well, other thing about what looks strange on, um, if you go back to I guess it's forty, which shows that uh, the drawing forty, which shows the um, the intersection of the uh, which, which shows the stairwell. And I wonder if we can pull that up. Yeah, you know, what looks what looks a little what when I saw this earlier and Commissioner May was looking at it, talking about it. Um, we talk about the the funny shape of the the garage and the way it bends and that. But also the way it meets the building, with the uh, with the skylight, with, with, with the solar panels, the roof of those, and the corner of the building, it just looks, it just looks awkward. It looks like it doesn't want to meet right, and it looks just like it's being they're being forced together. And maybe that's just the nature of the two types of structures. And maybe there's a better view of that. Um, but when we talk about lighting, also we talk about worry about the people across the street. It's going to be critical, I think, that the lighting that's placed underneath those solar structures, those angled solar structures, is going to have to be such a way that it's going to be not being able to spill out and direct it out too far. So I think that if we could have, if you could address that or talk about it or think about it and exa examine what kind of lighting you're going to see, because that's about what, a 15 foot height at least opening 15 to 20 feet up, up there? I'm not sure. So it's, there's a lot of room for light to spill out. And I think how you handle that, it is gonna be, has to be done very sensitively to, to the neighborhood and the surrounding area. So I'd like to see some thought put in as to how you're gonna address that. Um, I'm just concerned that you're gonna see, I mean, garages are not always the most beautiful thing. I mean, you've, got, you've, you've dealt with the concerns of the headlights with coming out and I appreciate that. Uh, but I'm just concerned about the overall spillage of light going into the neighborhood. And I'd like to hear some comments on how you're going to address that and make sure that that this isn't going to be a sore point for the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, I understand that is a very real concern. And as we look into that and we can look into that, how is that potentially going to be screened? What kind of full cutoff fe features or full cutoff uh, elements can be can be applied to the lighting to mitigate that. that yeah, I, I would I would appreciate it. I mean, I, I'm sure you're going to do that. Are you going to do 
you're, you've been thinking about it anyways, but if you could maybe address that and talk about it or show something, that'd be, I'd be appreciative of that. The other thing is we go back to what Commissioner May was talking about with the, um, uh, the um, trash and by the inline retail. Maybe you could pull that up, that slide um, by the Starbucks. Yeah, go way back to the site plan, I think. Be more ahead. One more. Two more. Two more. Next one. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, is there a way that we can we get a blow up of what that really looks like? Maybe even a better plan of of how that's actually going to work and interfere with the with the parking aisles and maybe as a, an elevation of what this thing is really how it's going to work or as some kind of a perspective. I'm just concerned that it's such a it's such a you know it's one of those utilitarian stupid things you need. And but how you handle it and how it looks with the relationship of people who are around there gets to be kind of an important feature. It's one of those dumb things. It's like we need it, but how are we going to do it? And I, I'd really like to see how, how you're going to handle that. Make make sure that it really is not an obtrusive sore thumb when you're done. Yeah, I mean it's a place behind a roll up door here in, inside the building, but we'll provide a little bit more detail. Yeah, and and the and the thing out in the, in the the actual uh, loading space and trash. If we could get a better view or a better picture, a blow up of what that looks like out there. That whole section in there we would be good to see is okay. blowing up. Okay, but the trash um, is internal to the building. It'll get pulled out, but we'll yeah. provide more detail. Uh, the other thing I hope you could talk about is in building, what is it, three, the residential building next door, block three. The block, the, yeah, it's block four, I guess it is. Uh, the um, could you pull up that plan? I'm look, curious about there's loading at the end of that building, and I, it's integrated on one plan, but I'm not sure what that what that really means. Because I think you're acting for flexibility, not to have actually a loading dock. It's at that far end. It, there's something that was marked by the uh, an amenity terrace. It's just to the just but to the bottom of that. Somewhere around there, there's something that's called loading, and I'm like, well, isn't that residential? So I'm just curious okay. as to what that really showed on that other drawing. On this drawing, uh, you'll see on the right hand side there is loading there for the retail and also for the residential uses. There's also, we don't have the lower level plan here, but also in the garage, there's an additional loading that comes in off of the other side of the building. But if you need clarification on the loading, the way the loading works for this building, we can certainly- Where is the entrance to the garage then? The How do you get into the garage? You go down, I can't indicate unfortunately, but you go down Town Center Drive and come in around the corner and you go in a level below this level. Okay. At the far, at the far I left. See the the curb curb. Far All left. I see, is a curb, I see a curb cut on the right for the where it looks to be a right. loading dock. Right. But I don't see a curb cut going in for a garage. Because it's it's a level below this level. That's why. Hmm. But we can provide well, more detail on the way the entrance. If you could, goes. I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Um. What are, I was worried because if you've only got the one loading dock, you got to go all the way from one end of the building to right. the other. No, there, there's there's loading docks on both ends of the building because of the length of the building. The and where does the trash the parking go garage is a level below this level, and we'll provide additional detail to make that clear. Okay, and where, is, where does the trash go out here? It could go out either end. It can either go on the right-hand side or it can go on the left-hand side. Right-hand side might be more for, for the retail there. It can okay. also go out the left-hand side. All right. I was just I, I was just confused. I didn't see enough information to tell me how easy it is for residents to get trash or a loading or to get into their or in and out of their apartments when they're moving in and out. Right. right. So if you could explain that or show something better, I would appreciate it. Okay. 
And the only other thing for Mr. Cummins is on page two of your of exhibit uh, 22, uh, flexibility for the project. Uh, and just pointing out something we've always we always talk about. Um, and then Mr. Reddick, I'm sure, is listening to uh, item item C to vary the selection of the exterior materials within the color ranges. Shouldn't be and it should be of the material type selected. We don't grant flexibility to change uh, colors of and the materials. You can change the colors of the material selected. Yep. Otherwise, you got to come back for a modification. Perfect. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, those are my questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Turnbull. Let's go to uh, Vice Chair Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you to the applicant's team for sticking with this project for 20 years, um, sticking together, um, long awaited, of course, in the community and by yourselves. You've done a lot of work on it, and you've added a new team member to deal with, um, to uh, add the uh, new component of a medical office building serving yet another underserved need on the um, east end of the city. Um, there's countless hours that so many uh, of you, the applicant team and uh, the community, ANC, uh, Fort Baker folks, uh, others, have put into trying to make this project a reality. I certainly put my little share of time in working for the council chairman and, and the mayor uh, who was interested in that area and lives nearby. Um, but, uh, and I certainly don't want to do anything to create any uh, roadblock or in moving this forward, but I generally support all of the questions and uh, issues that have been raised by my colleagues, particularly uh, those in the dialogue between uh, Commissioner Shapiro and uh, OAG uh, Attorney Jacob Riddig and, and uh, Applicants Council uh, Paul Tummins. I, I think that that dialogue, even though we don't have a party at this point in opposition to this case, I think the, uh, the, the issues that have been raised by Council with us um, on comprehensive plan consistency, on PUD balancing uh, of public benefits and amenities with whatever mitigations uh, of adverse impacts needs to be further fleshed out, particularly in light of some of the uh, adverse court decisions that this commission has uh, been on the receiving end of, including the most recent one at Parkview, where a portion of the uh, site similarly uh, was designated neighborhood conservation area and low density residential and, and I realized that a, Mo a Walmart was sitting on it on top of it at this area the last time we uh, I mean in, in the first stage the last time uh, but I think we need a better evaluation of why the comp plan other comp plan policies would outweigh a potential inconsistency with those low density residential and neighborhood conservation portions designated for the site where there's going to be multiple stories of building um, uh, there. And on the, and this is really, this is pertaining mostly to block, this is pertaining mostly to block four, because that's where you're going back to the you're changing the configuration and you're going back to a first stage PUD where we get to push back on whether new requirements apply versus those in 2009, which didn't include any inclusionary zoning requirements. Although I realized that the disposition, land disposition agreement uh, negotiated and approved by the city and by the city council actually produces more total affordable, so-called affordable housing units than IZ currently requires, but not more deeply affordable units than IZ currently requires 
which has changed because uh, we've had a lot of experience with that 80% AMI, which you're setting aside, and uh, 80% median family income, which you're setting aside 20% for as part of the affordable housing proffer in the original case, and then an additional 10% up to 120% median family income. Our experience, and I think the city's experience and the new mayor's policies on affordable housing, I think uh, make a strong case, a compelling case for revisiting uh, those MFI levels for at least the block four residential units and getting into the more the 60% and 80% level rather than this 80% and 120% level which isn't really serving the residents uh, who need affordable housing in our city. So I would, I would strongly encourage the applicant without trying to do anything to set back this project more than the 20 years that it's already been set back. Although there's been a lot of progress, a lot of setbacks. Um, I do appreciate you stuck th with it through thick and thin, but I encourage that dialogue with the uh, OAG to to address these issues so we have an order that is uh, reflective of the types of decisions we need to make to uh, respond right uh, respond to the DC Court of Appeals concerns legitimate or otherwise uh, and I was but I would still strongly encourage you to revisit those IZ inclusionary zoning well, it's not inclusionary zoning here, it's affordable housing commitments, um, to make those affordable housing commitments more in line with at least on block four, which is gonna be now a first stage PUD. At this stage, make it a, a more of a commitment to the current median family income levels, which I think will serve better the uh, needs, not only of the east end of the city, but the entire city in terms of affordable housing. So I don't really have any other questions, Mr. Chairman, but I just encourage that dialogue between the applicants council, our council, and um, uh, look forward to this case moving forward and, the de and more development on this site um, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Mr. Thomas, I, I want to pick back up on my discussion uh, when I chimed in while Commissioner Shapiro was is speaking about what OAG has flagged us on. I really appreciate what Mr. Redding has done. Uh, I think he's done a great job. and has been a doing a great job with us addressing the so-called courts. But really for me, I'm not really concerned about the courts. I'm gonna do the best we can uh, for, for the, um, in which our scope of our work is. If the courts wanna overrule me, that's fine. I'm just gonna to continue to do the best I can. I'm not gonna to try to gear anything towards the court, the court of appeals. I'm not gonna do that. If they want to trump me, fine. If they want me to answer something else later on, I will. But I do think, uh, and I said this to Mr. Redding in other cases, I do think his approach, I think when we look at start looking at impacts, and I think that's something we left out. At the end of the day, it's our decision. It's not Mr. Redding's decision. It's not the African, it's the zoning commission's decision. So what I've always employed and asked OAG to do for me is help me get there. And this is one of those projects. I want to make sure we're within the legal bounds with, within the code, but I also want to make sure that we understand what we're doing. So the, uh, for me, what I asked for was a, uh, a sound bite. Like the new block one is Western portion of the original block one. Just help me understand what's going on. And you may have it, you may have it there. And if you have it there, then just direct me to it. Uh, I know it's there, but it's probably on one page. And, this, and then if we talk about the block four merging back, it's probably that's probably on another page. I just need to see it all in one place, and I think it'll be easy. Those discussions with you and OAG, I think, are going to be very helpful to help us get there. I don't necessarily have any questions. I actually like everything I saw. My colleagues, I think, did a great job. That's the good part about going last. The only thing I will say, and I think this record reflects, and we we talked about the street behind the bloom test and what was going on. I think this record, and and I may be wrong. I think Ward Seven. Eight, six, five. I think those wards are ready for a lot of leaders. I think leaders, here's what I don't want to happen. I don't want us to put so much red tape in the process that leaders pack their bags and go. I don't, I don't know what the, the tenant issue is, but I do know one of the things that I've heard consistently 
across this city for years. I think I've been around this for the whole 20 years or so. And I know the vice chair has probably been even longer than that. But I think it's time for Skyline. Uh, let's make it work legally, Mr. Reddy and Mr. Thomas. Let's make it work. Let's make sure that we put stuff in a legal uh, format within our regulations. And let's get it done. Adding all the, and I've heard all my colleagues say we don't want to add red tape. Look, for 20 years, I think it's been enough red tape. The last time we had this, I think I may have asked when we talked about the Walmart. No, I think I may have asked, are we going to get it done? So I'm going to ask that again this time. And I hope 20 years from later, my successor doesn't come back and have to ask the same, same question. Uh, Mr. Thomas, are we going to get it done? I'm going to let Mr. Rappaport and Mr. Fennell have the thing to answer that question. We got to do our part, but I want to know if we're going to get it done. Commissioner Hood, yes, I'm telling you, this is the most important project in my entire career. I've said that to so many people over 20 years. Yes, we're going to get it done, but but time does put things beyond all our control. And what you're right, these are very dangerous times for all of us. And we don't control legal, except we have a signed lease that we have to perform within a certain period of time. We have that time now, and, and I believe that we will get this done and we will get this entire project completed as we proposed. Okay. And again, the caveat for me again is I want to make sure we're within the code. We're going to do things right. We're going to make sure, as, as the vice chair and others have mentioned, make sure our order is sufficient. But I just believe that, you know, we, while we need to do some legal sufficiency stuff, I just don't want to keep adding stuff to make, you know, I, the architectural design, the lighting, all that's great. We can work that out and get that done. But I think I got my ear to the ground. And I think the residents of that area, not just Award 7, Award 8 as well, we want to make sure that they get the necessary fresh groceries and whatever they need there. So that's that's why I'm the bottom line. That's why I am. As long as we got the legal sufficiency, and I appreciate Mr. Redding flagging us uh, for some of those issues, because I think he's, like I said previously, uh, and I may sound redundant, but that's just how I do. I, I really appreciate that and getting that done to flag us. And I appreciate Commissioner uh, Shapiro for bringing those up. But anyway, that sound bite is all I need. I don't have any questions or comments. I think. Uh, Everybody else's question, I mean, they've already covered all the architectural issues. And I think with all of what I heard, I think Ward 7, Ward 8, and even the city, because I plan on going over there as well. Well, if, hopefully, this, that's what I'm saying. I plan on going there as well to see exactly what's been done after we've done this. Uh, I think this is going to be a, a good piece for the city. So I'm, I'm definitely supportive. Let's just get there where we need to be. Let's tighten up all the loose ends and let's move forward. Mr. Shapiro. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry after, after that. I'm. I'm I'm filled with the feelings that you're conveying, and I have a very technical question uh, for the for the applicant. Um, the you've designed this is a six level garage. Is that right? Five levels. Five level garage. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you've designed the, the circulation pattern. You've designed it where it's uh, you sort of climb up each ramp. Right. You, or a speed ramp at the end, or it's was it cost prohibitive or we actually tried a speed ramp centrally um, in, in an initial study, um, and we actually didn't didn't have the real estate for it. Uh, yeah. Was basically the reason. Okay, that's fine. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, I know I don't. There was a letter, uh, Ms. Marlin, but you know what? I can ask that when you come back up if we have any rebuttal. Uh, I, I think she may be on the line. I'll let her. Uh, do her testimony. If not, I'll bring it, uh, get some of her concerns up afterwards, but I'll let her bring them up to us and then I'll, we'll mention that later. Okay. Um, any other follow-up questions, colleagues? Uh, Vice Chair Miller? Yeah, I, I just meant, I think it's referenced in something I read, but on the medical office building, uh, I guess to the applicant, you have some kind of letter of intent or commitment, preliminary quick commitment from GW Health or? Um, I think no, I think at this point, we've, we've reached out to the various healthcare providers uh, throughout the city, GW, Johns Hopkins, um, United Medical Center. And like that, that, those are the, I think we want to convey that those are the, uh, the potential tenants we are looking for to come into this facility. Okay. 
Uh, so I, I, I heard uh, Mr. Rappaport's uh, comment about time is important when you've got certain uh, preliminary commitments, and I, I certainly don't, I certainly echo the chairman's uh, and others' views that the whatever momentum this project has in moving forward needs to continue. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair. Any other, any other comments, colleagues? Okay, um, let's go to uh, any cross examination. I have A and C seven B and eight B. I know eight B at was I didn't see it. I don't think they gave us anything. Yeah, Michelle, do we know if we have a representative that may want to do cross examination from either one of those A and Cs? Sorry, let me check. Um, we had one that may have Miss Brown. Let's see if she ended up showing up. She was not sure. I do not see her on here. Okay. All right. So, so we have no one at least yet of A and C seven. So let's let's move Office of Planning and District of Transportation. I believe Ms. Brown Robinson, I think Mr. Zimmerman, or is it, I think Ms. Cow, or Car, or I may have the names wrong, she'll correct me. So we can bring them up. We'll have the Office of Planning report, get that report. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. This is Maxine Brown Roberts from the Office of Planning on Zoning Commission case 08 dash. 03F. OP recognizes that the redevelopment of Skyland has been, has had many modifications to bring the redevelopment to fruition. And although lacking in some of the original elements of the town center, the proposed modification represents a great opportunity for the location of a new grocery store, a medical office building, a coffee shop, and other retail uses. The applicant has addressed many of the issues identified by the Office of Planning and the Zoning Commission at set down and has provided additional information regarding the signage which OP requested. The number of additional inf the number of residential units in the overall development would be slightly increased and not decrease as um, as we mistakenly stated in our report. Regarding the IZ units which um, which I heard some of the commissioners mention. The original order required 20% of the units to be reserved for households at 80% of MFI and 10% of households earning 120% of MFI across the entire project. The, the IZ requirement is consistent with the disposition agreement which governs the property. This requirement would be maintained on block four. The application, um, which we submitted to DHCD to, to be reviewed, and um, they stated that the number of units that would be generated would be greater than the um, ZR16 requirements. However, um, they are still um, recommending and will work with the applicant to provide units at lower MFI, and they will provide a report for the residential building at second stage review. OP supportive of the areas of flexibility that is requested. We believe that blocks one and two are not inconsistent with the future land use map and general, generalized policy map and policies for the comprehensive plan and specifically for the Skyland Multi Neighborhood Center. Um, as stated, I think what we will do is go back and look at the area for block four for compatibility and to address any um, any areas that the Zoning Commission may want us to look at. Um, in summary, the Office of Planning recommends that a requested modification of significance in the first state PUD be approved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm available for questions. Okay, thank you, Ms. brown Robbins. I think we'll go to DDOT and then we'll ask questions of both at the same time. Mr. Zimmerman. Okay. Good evening, Chairman Hood and members of the commission. For the record, I'm Aaron Zimmerman with the District Department of Transportation. Uh, DDOT is supportive of the revisions proposed in this application. The changes in uses are projected to result in fewer vehicle trips generated during the weekday evening and Saturday peak hours as compared to the previous 
approval and the revised project includes 117 fewer parking spaces. The applicant has already constructed substantial roadway improvements based on the higher trip generating prior development that was approved and, um, and these facilities will be adequate to facilitate ingress and egress to the site. Uh, these improvements included several traffic signals at the site entrances, closure of the Naylor Road slip lane adjacent to Block 2, and intersection reconfigurations around the site. We did request a couple conditions in our report. The first is a loading management plan to address the loading relief with Block 3, and the second is to strengthen the TDM plan to encourage more usage of non-auto travel. As you heard in Mr. Andres's presentation, the applicant has agreed to those conditions. Regarding the TDM plan, we are working out the final language with the applicant um, and expect that to be completed shortly after this hearing. The updated TDM plan will include the original transportation management plan, plus other items such as the expansion of the existing bike share station on Alabama Avenue, providing bike share passes to employees, unbundling parking, and lots of other strategies. So with the loading management plan and the finalized TDM plan both included in the final zoning order, DDOT has no objection to the approval of this modification of significance. Thank you. Thank you, uh, commissioners. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Let me go with Commissioner May of either OP or DDOT. I do not have any questions. Okay. Um, Commissioner Shapiro. Uh, Commissioner Turnbull. I'm good, thank you. Okay, uh, and Vice Chair Miller. Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your reports. Okay, thank you, um, Ms. Brown Robinson, Mrs. Zimmerman. Appreciate your reports. Let's see if before you go, though, uh, does the applicant have any uh, questions? No questions. Okay, I uh, don't have anyone from the ASC as of yet. So we thank you both. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other government? I think it's, I do know there were comments from DOEE. Uh, that may have been covered, I believe, in Office Planning Report as well. Uh, or maybe it was our council who mentioned it. But I'm sure that that, that will be worked on as well. Um, that was Exhibit 21 from DOEE. And no others. Okay. The exhibit, what exhibit was that, Mr. Shaw? Exhibit 21? 21. Okay, From DOE. Anyway, yeah, that, I'll let the uh, applicant work. <laughs> I'm sure all that'll be worked out. Because I don't, whatever's in there, that's quite a bit of action. I missed that earlier. Um, now, the ANC, um, let me go to their report, uh, Exhibit 23. Uh, and what I liked about what I saw that the ANC did on this sheet, this is our regular sheet, but uh, I guess it's uh, uh, Commissioner Brown. Um, I'm not sure if she's the chairperson or the vice chair. I don't see it. But either way, she's either the chair or the vice chair. Forgive me for not. One, which one? But I, I really appreciate how they listed, how they notified. ANC 7B gives provides notice of its public meeting on the following platforms: East of the River Community Newspaper, Hill, Hillcrest Listserv, Penn Branch Listserv, Fairfax Village Listservs, Randall Highlands Listservs, Ward 7 Listservs, www.anc7b.com, ANC 7B Twitter account, Next Door, and the DC Calendar. I really appreciate what, what ASC 7B uh, does to get the word out. So I, I really feel they, they too have said they had no issues. They voted, um, I'm a member of council the quorum of four, I'm a member president of the meeting. The ANC has no issues or concerns as it relates to the standards of the zone regulations in this case. The ANC supports the PVD uh, modification of significance as filed. All right. Um, Let's go to, do we have any organizations or persons who are here? Oh, wait a minute, let me let me acknowledge this other letter that I saw who I think the applicants going to do business with them. Uh, D-Bar, but let me see, I don't know what exhibit it was now. Uh, uh, 
All right, I'll, I'll come back to it. And also, well, let me let me see who's there first, and then I'll mention who we have letters of support uh, from. Because I don't I want to make sure people take time to write us a letter, write us where they're standing on. I would I want to make sure to uh, be acknowledged. Let me go to the. Do we have any organizations or persons uh, who are in support who are on the line, Michelle or Ms. Young? Yes, Miss Marlin, Robin Marlin. Miss Robin Marlin, do we have anyone else? She's the only one, I believe, that was. Let me double check. Well, why don't we bring everybody up if we get the platform to hold it? Um, support opposition. Um, there was nobody signed up in opposition, and everybody else was part of the applicant's team except for the ANC person, and she only tentatively was accepting. So the only person we have tonight is Ms. Marlin in okay, support, as a bring, proponent. Let's bring Ms. Marlin up. Um, this is uh, Michelle. Did Earl Williams? He, he conveyed oh, to yes, us to be. Earl Williams, he is on. I thought he was part of the applicant's uh, team. So, yes, Earl Williams would be the other one. Okay, let's bring both uh, Mr. Williams and Ms. Marlin up. Yeah. Sorry, I thought he was part of your team, Mr. Oh, Summers. He's, he's with the Skyland Task Force. Okay. So, if you wish to, if you can turn your cameras on. If not, we respect that. If you want to leave them off, you can. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Ms. Marlon. I haven't seen you in a while. You gonna let me see you? Uh, you know, I apologize. So, uh, just, you know, Mr. Uh, uh, I was talking, Mr. Turnhill, uh, Paul, and I'm not familiar with this format. So let me just see. I can. Let's see here. Start. No, that's not the right thing. Sorry about you. that. Do you see can your you see me? Yeah, there you uh, go. Raise, <laughs> raise it up a little bit so I can see. I haven't seen you in a while. How you been? <laughs> <laughs> How are you? So I borrowed this computer to participate in this. Um, as I said, I was talking with Paul about my concerns, and uh, he's been very kind to communicate back uh, back and forth with me. So that's fine. But um, I am a supporter of the Skyland Project because I've um, I've been with the project twenty years at least. And uh, however, my concern was with the reallocation of the community benefits. Uh, as you know, uh, Commissioner Hood, I served on the ANC for 14 years. Uh, in that role, I was the chair for, for over five years, vice chair, secretary. Uh, and we started this process uh, long before I became a commissioner. I was active on actually the, the, the uh, task force that selected Rappaport for the development. But I, I wanted, I had to deviate a little bit from my testimony because I want to address something that Mr. Fennell, I'm not familiar with who he is, Mr. Fennell. Um, I sort of was taken back with his uh, characterization of me as being a lone soul, I think he said oppositioner or something to that nature. And that's not the intent of my appearance before the Zoning Commission. My intent is to basically uh, because Mr. Williams' letter was not uh, read uh, at the ANC meeting, uh, didn't know if the Zoning Commission also was aware that the, uh, I guess the developer is asking that the remaining amounts of the community benefits be reallocated to the Sky, uh, to the uh, Skyland uh, Workforce Development Center on Alabama Avenue. Um, so I have read the file. Uh, I've done my due diligence. And I looked at uh, exhibit uh, number 2222B uh, as it relates to the benefits. <clears throat> and I, I'm very uh, active in my community, so I'm also a part of the Francis Gregory Library. Um, so I'm not aware of any funds coming to the, I'll just use as an example, the Francis Gregory Library. So I was wondering if there is some uh, way that the contributions can be publicly disclosed. So that the community is aware of the Rappaport and have been very generous to our community. I have uh, no opposition to that, but I do think that um, a letter coming from a non-sanctioned task force, a task force that really has not been functioning in our community um, and asking for uh, a negotiated contract to be revised, to be changed, needed um, 
needed some further discussion, if I can say it that way. I, I think there needs to be communication with the community. And one of the commissioners asked if the residents on Fort Baker Drive have been part of the discussion. And I think the uh, respondent said maybe they reached out or something. I think Mr. Funnel said that, but he doesn't appear to me. I mean, he's busy. He's talking about the fact that I'm the only one inquiring about this, but out of respect for Paul and Gary, I didn't make my concerns known publicly. I didn't go out and publicize it. Well, you know, uh, Mr. Williams has sent a letter uh, supporting the developer reallocating the community benefits uh, that we negotiated on many, many years ago, long before Mr. Williams became involved, long before he lived in the community. So uh, I sort of, sort of take sense. I don't know Mr. Fennell, so I don't think he can characterize my involvement in the community. It's been longstanding. Gary can attest to that. I've been a part of this project. I have testified on behalf of the Skyline Task. Bob Richards and I testified uh, before the city council, in fact, to make sure the financing came through, the additional financing that uh, Gary Rappaport needed. So I don't want to be viewed by anybody on a Rappaport team as I'm in opposition or I have a gripe with the project. I have been waiting as long as anyone <laughs> sitting uh, in this meeting for this project to come to completion. But I am concerned that uh, the community is not really being uh, updated, not by Rappaport, but by this pseudo task force that no one knows who the members are. There are no uh, documented minutes or or agenda items or any type, type of uh, way to substantiate <sighs> that the community has been a part of these decision making uh, uh, highlights, if I can call it a highlight, this reallocation, because it's it's really being highlighted separate from the uh, development project itself. So um, I, that's the only thing I, th I think that's all I wanted to say. Uh, but I do want to I do want to make sure that Mr. Fennell understands that I am not a lone soul. If I wanted to get support for this particular matter, I could get that. But I felt like it's best to try to find out what's going on first with the um, the monetary contributions, if we can get clarification on that. I mean, that would be very satisfactory. So I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Marlin. Uh, I know your work uh, around the city for a very long time. So I, I, I appreciate all you do and all you have done and all you will continue to do. Uh, but let me just ask, I don't see a letter from, unless I'm, I, I can overlook stuff. I don't see a Mr. Williams. Can somebody tell me what exhibit that is? It's dated, I, it's dated uh, June 16, 2020. It's, it's paragraph three. June 16. What, what exhibit is it, Ms. Marlon? You know? Oh, oh I know the date. The date is June 16, 2020. Mr. Tummins, he may know. Uh, oh, I guess he's muted. <laughs> Sorry, somebody, somebody wrote. Oh, okay. I see. I see. I see one from Graham Pressburg. I see your letter. It, it's like in one point type. I can't read it. I think it's nineteen, but I'm not sure. My, 19. I don't know. It's really tiny. Okay, I see it now. Okay, so I was actually looking for his name. And then we one task force. Nineteen is correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Okay, the task force. You did say task force. I saw that. Okay. All right. uh, we will let uh, the applicant respond. So thank you again, Ms. Martin. Let's see if we have any questions, Commissioners. Uh, Commissioner May. Nothing. Okay. Okay. Uh, Commissioner uh, Shapiro. I have no questions, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, uh, Commissioner Turnbull. I have no commissions. I have no questions. Thank you for coming. And Thank vice you. Uh, no questions. Thank you, Ms. Marlin. Thank so, you. So, um, Mr. Thomas, did you have any thoughts or questions for Ms. Ms. Marlin? No questions for Ms. Marlin. Okay. So, I would like for us to respond to her uh, uh, questions because she has been here from the start on this project and many others in the city. 
So I, I would like to know a little bit more about, uh, and I'm sure Mr. Williams will come on as well. But let me, um, uh, again, thank you, Ms. Martin, for taking the time to testify and uh, still be responsive, like you've always been, and, and doing your due diligence for the, for the city, not just for the neighborhood, but for the city as well. So I really appreciate that. It's thank you so much. You. Always good to thank see you. you. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, take care. Um, let's see, who, do we have anybody else, Michelle? Uh, Mr. Williams? That was Williams. it. Other than Mr. I have Williams. Mr. Williams he call there? In. He's Mr. calling Williams in, call okay? Okay, Mr. Williams, you, you may begin. Uh, you you can begin, you, Mr. Williams. You keep on unmuting yourself and muting yourself. You just need to hit it one time. You should be able to talk now. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Right. Can you hear me? Sure. You can't hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Sure, we can okay. hear you. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Chairman Hood. Um, uh, where to begin? Uh, first of all, like I appreciate you and all the other commissioners stating that you really want to move this uh, this project forward. Um, the task force that I chair has been in existence for over five years. Uh, the members are uh, listed. Uh, as a matter of fact, Commissioner Brown is the vice chair of the task force. Uh, and she is in constant contact with not only those um, neighbors on Fort Baker, but also on other streets that abut the project. Uh, we we don't hold regular meetings. What we do is uh, our purpose is to make sure that what has been promised to the community by the developers is actually delivered. Uh, and the developers have done a wonderful job in communicating everything that's going on in the project to us. And we in turn communicate that to the community by putting on the Hillcrest listserv. Uh, we participate in the construction meetings when we could before COVID-19 stopped them. Uh, we had regular uh, construction update meetings that the uh, task force put out information on and participated in. Um, there are some people in the community that um, d aren't happy with the way my task force was created. But uh, again, my vice chair is uh, Commissioner Brown, 7B02, uh, and we do represent uh, the vast majority of the community. Um, when it comes to the letter and our recommendation uh, that part of the money be reallocated um, for the, from the community benefit, um, as was stated earlier in, in a testimony, that does not impact monies allocated for schools, libraries, or community benefits. It is simply those monies that were set aside for loans for um, um, uh, companies working on the project and uh, for um, subsidized housing uh, on the project. Uh, those funds were coming to our community anyway. And since they're no longer needed, I have no problem with those funds being reallocated. And that's basically my statement. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Williams, and, and appreciate the work the task force does as well, regardless of how I got started. We appreciate this. One thing I always tell people, work ain't crowded. Uh, you can you can always uh, find people who want to do so. Well, we may agree or disagree, but I appreciate the work that anybody does in, in this city uh, or not, uh, just anywhere, anything I'm involved in. When you see people trying to get engaged and get involved, yeah, we don't have disagreements. So I appreciate you may, the work you do as you well as- As president of the Federation of Citizens Associations, You've testified uh, and, and spoken to our group several times over the years. And, um, Mr. Will, oh, I have? Yes. How did I do? No, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you were fine. Uh, you, uh, some, some of us were a little hostile, but uh, you held your own. Okay, okay. Oh, I remember that one, yeah. Okay. I would like to forget that. But anyway, um, so, so we, again, we appreciate all the work you all do. Let me see if my commissioners have any questions or comments. Uh, Commissioner May, 
you know, if we don't have to unmute, if y'all shake your heads, that'd be good. Okay, uh, Vice Chair, I mean, I'm Commissioner Shapiro, uh, Commissioner Turnbull, Vice Chair Miller. Uh, Mr. Thomas, do you have any cross? No cross. Okay, um, and I do want to follow up and ask you questions about that, Mr. Thomas, as we, as we do, the, do the rebuttal. So thank you, uh, Mr. Williams, and, and, and also thank you, Ms. Marlon. We appreciate you both. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So I think, um, I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Thomas, how all that works with these benefits, and I'm, I'm sure the app, when you all have that together, I know it's, you know, transfer, if it's gonna be a transfer and all that, I'm not sure how that works. Uh, but I do know that there are some legal requirements that we have to go by, uh, and I'm sure that you and OAG would have that. If something could be moved or not moved, the request would come, or have you already done it? I'm not on that, so I mean, I'm not sure about that. So let's make sure we fine tune that so we can satisfy both Mr. Williams and Ms. Uh, Mr. Williams and Ms. Marlin uh, in their comments, because we appreciate them taking the time to come down. So let's do uh, some rebuttal, and then we'll do some closing. Perfect. For rebuttal, we just um, we have uh, I think Mr. Fennell um, to talk a little bit about uh, the reallocation of the benefits and amenities and um, uh, his ability to uh, reach out to uh, Ms. Marlin. Uh, thank you, Paul. There's three things I'd like to clarify. First, I want to thank uh, Ms. Marlin for her support and for her clarification. Um, for clarification purposes, I'd like to reread the sentence that I read earlier, just so we're clear um, that um, I wasn't trying to pick a fight with Ms. Marlin. I really was trying to um, uh, emphasize uh, that there was no known opposition to the modification. It was more a question about the uh, expenditure of uh, community benefits. And since I was asked to do the community benefits and outreach update, um, I think Mr. Williams covered uh, what I had said and what we had presented to the community before, which is that we are taking uh, dollars that were originally set aside under the original PUD for a contractor loan, as well as for home buyer training, and we're taking those funds and reapplying them to the Skyland Workforce Center. We are not changing any of our commitments, nor diminishing any of the dollars that were committed to schools and libraries nor for the public. Um, and uh, as far as uh, hosting further meetings, I think it's important to clarify that, uh, you know, uh, Gary and Chris and the Rappaport companies and Smith companies, I I've lost track uh, over the years, the number of meetings that they've talked about that they've all attended. Um, I certainly have been at some, not, not most, but some of those meetings, and we would be happy to go to additional meetings uh, where we could zero in on this conversation and make sure that there's clarity as to uh, the entirety of the funds. That's my statement. Thank you, Brett. So I'd say uh, that concludes our rebuttal. Um, and if we wanna have any discussion about that and then we can do our brief uh, conclusion and uh, talk about next steps. I think it'd be good to maybe uh, have a virtual. Uh, you don't necessarily have to go, Mr. Fano, but maybe if you can give them Ms. Marlon and Mr. Williams, let's have a virtual. I'd like to see some closure to that. I think that's very beneficial, even though we may disagree, but I think the conversation, uh, I would like to see it have. Um, so with that, we'll look forward to you. Maybe doing a virtual. You don't have to get together for coffee, and I'm like, not through this time. I would not suggest that. We'll try to do a virtual if you're able to set that up. Let me see if my colleagues have any follow-up questions or comments before we hear closing. Uh, Commissioner May. Uh, Commissioner Shapiro, I see your hands. Okay, all right, I see your hands. Okay, great. All right, so Mr. Thomas, if you can close this out. Sure. Uh, thank you for your time and um, effort. Uh, I especially want to thank uh, Commissioner Marlin for reaching out to us uh, to bring this to our attention. Um, like I said, I think that she has spent a long time um, over the years working on this project. And we want to make sure that people who've been working on this project for a long time um, uh, feel that it is really uh, meeting the goals and needs of the community that was envisioned at the beginning and is now. And similarly, I'd like to uh, also uh, thank Mr. Williams for his significant uh, commitment and help with this project over the last five years and its stewardship of the task force, as well as we haven't um, talked 
uh, as much, but uh, Tiffany Williams, our ANC 7B commissioner, uh, who has been a, uh, a a real supporter of this project, a real supporter of, and that her community is aware of the status of Skyland and of making sure that it is the project that everyone hopes it can be. With that, I share the excitement um, that our team has about we think that this we are on the path to making this happen. I appreciate the comments. We appreciate the comments of the commissioners about wanting to make this happen. And we will work, uh, myself, uh, Ms. Hodel Cox, Mr. Ridding, on making sure that we are, as I think Mr. Miller said, crossing our T's um, and dotting our I's uh, so that you know this is a project which uh, we know is fully supportive, uh, supported, I should say, by the comprehensive plan and making sure that the Zoning Commission has the proper uh, information in front of it so that they can make a well-reasoned uh, decision um, in this case. So with that, uh, you know, we will submit all of the information that was requested in this meeting. Truthfully, I think uh, with regards to the, uh, the architectural materials, it's not a, you know, I, a lot of this information we have, a lot of this information we can, pair, we can uh, prepare pretty readily. Similarly, us with the uh, comprehensive plan analysis. So I think that it would be imminently reasonable for us to be able to look at having this teed up for a decision uh, by the Zoning Commission in September. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Let me note that, and I want to make sure when, when community groups, especially right or left, I, I wanted to go over this before you get your closing. I also want to thank Delmar Freeman. Uh, also, um, we have a letter in support from um, Graylin W. Pressbury, who used to be the president of the Federation. I, I know he's the president, president of Fairlawn now. And I think, and I hope I've covered everyone. I'm going to have one more 22A. Oh, yeah, 22A. Also appreciate the support letter from One second, 22A. I just had it open, man. Hold on a second. Okay, the um, president, president of the building bridges across the river. So I want to thank all of them for taking the time to, to write us a letter and let us know where their support lies uh, in this project. So with that, uh, Commissioners, any follow-up questions or comments, Commissioner May? I see his, okay, I see all his uh, vice chair and CEO, okay. All right, so Michelle and Kim, with some dates. Yes, sir. So I think that um, giving the applicant and OAG as much time as possible to work together, if we could have the applicant submit um, all of the requested documents and draft findings, facts, conclusions of law by 3 p.m. on September 1st, and uh, given the ANC as much time as they need uh, until 3 p.m. on September 11th, if the applicant would work with them on that, then we can put this on for our September 14th public meeting, our only meeting for that month. And that'll be for 4 o'clock p.m. Okay, I want to thank you. Uh, everything, um, this case is closed with the exception of things that we asked for. Thank you, Michelle, with dates. Mr. Thomas, do you have any other questions for Michelle? No, no questions. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their participation. I don't guess my colleagues have anything else, but let me just note the Zona Commission has 13 items on the agenda for uh, July the 27th, which is coming Monday at 4 p.m. We'll be back on this coming Monday, our Zona Commission, July the 27th, 20 at 4 p.m. Uh, Vice Chair Miller. Yeah, we're going to encourage uh, everyone to uh, attend virtually the uh, Nats home, which is what I've attended for the last 15 years since that play has returned. Here, here. We have 35 minutes before first pitch. Oh, maybe no let's go for Dr. Fauci's ceremonial pitch. Yeah. All right, so with that, uh, thanks, everybody. This hearing is adjourned. Good night.